multinationals, Ahel Dahez. Ahel Dahez owns some of the most recognizable brands, the Atos for your toiletries, the Khalakhal for your student parties, the Dahez for our Belgium audience, and of course, everyone's favorite, the undeniably blue Albert Heijn. And whilst the Albert Heijn has remained blue over the years, there have been some serious changes. If you go to most Albert Heijns nowadays, even the one around the corner, you will see a series of self-checkout machines. Is this how Al Dehez sees the future? Or will the future be online with companies such as Bull.com? I mean, who has bought something online this year? Raise your hand. What have you bought? Sorry. <laughs> Wait. And someone else? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's good to know that our audience is uh, very well read. <laughs> Anyways, without further ado, let's welcome onto our stage the CEO and President of Ahel Dahez, Dick Boer. Good afternoon, that's Good a afternoon. deep couch here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, welcome from my behalf as well. Uh, we have seen you, when researching for this interview, we saw you uh, giving interviews at Davos, we saw you uh, giving interviews at the most prominent financial channels in the world, and now you are here, room for discussion. Why did you accept our invitation? Because it's the most important one. Exactly. <laughs> because here I can talk to the students, to the future of our, uh, our world. So that's even more important to talk to you here in this audience and, uh, and, and to everyone who's hopefully listening in or looking later at your uh, broadcasting of it, but I think this is for me important to share our views, but also you're the future of the world. So what next? It's the most important thing I can do. And would you also say that this is a nice way to reflect back onto your career? Today? Today. Yes. Well, you, you know, I'm, uh, I'm retiring at the end of, uh, in the middle of this year, so I will, I will on one hand look back, but also look f future forward. So um, I'm 60, so I have a, a new future again for me. And one, one guy once learned me, he said, look, you, you learn, you earn, and you return. And if you put that in three times 30 years, then it's the time of return. So what can I do more? <laughs> returning knowledge, returning uh, my views of the world, returning my knowledge uh, and my experience. And we were actually asked to send a little biography um, of the both of us to you. And it is the first time a guest has asked us to do something like this. Why did you want to get to know us better? I think it's always nice when you uh, meet your journalist or when you're a journalist, you're, 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 you're the one who's interviewing me. Mm -hmm. I want to know what, where you come from, what you've done, how you, what your city is. So that's always nice for me to understand too. Well, that's good uh, to know that you know us a bit more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, before we delve into the future, as the title of this interview suggests, the future of retail, I think it's nice if we actually look at the back, uh, at, at the past, uh, the history of Ahold. And one of the key things I've always wondered about Ahold El Hayes, uh, the two companies, is how these two uh, family-owned small businesses from uh, relatively small countries became giants in retail. What would you say was the key for this success story to happen? Well, I think if you go back in the history, uh, this in, in, in a way very... Uh, specifically, I think, driven by the family ownership of the companies because of their values and their willingness continues to innovate and to look ahead of the game. Which values? And I think if you look at values, it's about innovation, it's about customer first, it's about integrity, of course, so take care for the products, where they come from, and integrity is everywhere for, for us. It's societal impact, so are we taking care for the society we're in? Because that's the role you play as a retailer. We always think it's a store where you do your shopping, but it's a whole world around it. So it's 370,000 people are working for us around the globe. So uh, Ajo Del Hayes has always had this stakeholder uh, view. Yeah, I think if you, if, you would, and if, you, if you would read back the history and you would read uh, the book of uh, Mr. Hein, uh, who was the last Hein who was running the company in the 80s of the last century, and you read this book, it has a combination of innovation, uh, strong leadership on driving uh, the opportunities of the food retail, but also societal impact. How do you care? He was the one, one of the first companies, Albert Heijn, who had a workers' council in the Netherlands. Um, the workers' council was, I think, in the 50s already 
the first thing what Mr. Hein thought about. I want to engage our employees. When was this year again? When, when I think at the end of the 50s and the 60s already established the Workers' Council for Albert Hein at that moment. Now, the Delas family is a 150 years old company, even a bit older than Albert Hein, has similar values. That's also why, and the companies went through a similar phase um, of development. They were trying to discover the world. Uh, Ahold Delas today has more than 6,000 stores around the globe of which two-thirds of the stores of the business, not the stores, the sales is done in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you look at the history, both companies went in the 70s to start looking at the United States, what they can acquire there or start up. So it's nice to see that these companies are coming together. But I think the true value, customer first, associates matter for us. They are the ones who make the customer interaction are so important for a company like ours. One of them here is from uh, various people that family-owned businesses are often stubborn or unwilling to change. How was Ahold, uh, well, uh, Ahold and the Hoyes, how were they able to avoid this? I think, first of all, what family business need to do is to uh, have enough um, interaction and creating leadership teams which are not only family-driven. So you need to attract leaders in your team, and that the, the Heinz did it already in the 50s, 60s, to get people from the outside in their business. Um, not as a leader, quite often, of course, the CEO was a Deleuze mm -hmm. or an, uh, a family or an Albert Heinz family. That's one. Secondly, you need to have in retail a nature of, 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 of looking for innovation. If not, then you're copied easily, and then somebody else but is taken over. But how can you have that nature in yourself? Well, as first as a of all, secondly, of course, I think also what happened also with the family, in this case the Hein, they went stock listed already in the early days. Nine. Yeah, so 50s, 60s, they already went to the stock exchange. So you have to start reporting as an international company. You mentioned the values of customer first, and I think customers first also means trust between consumer and the company, in a sense. Would you say that the trust from Ahold and the trust from Del Hez actually helped the merge in 2015? Yeah, I think it is very important if you do a merger and you try to get two companies together, you need mutual trust between both leaders, um, that you both do that only with one IDE. It's not about you, it's about bringing two companies together because it's better to have them together, better together is also our strategy, and, you, and it's not about you. Uh, as a leader, by the way, as a CEO, you have to have that clear uh, humility also in you because it's not about you. It's about the companies together. It's about the fact that you want to bring this company uh, making a better business model out of it. And I think that's what the companies brought together, and that's also why humility matters. So. And would you say that values, similar values, similar backgrounds, and similar beliefs also help this? Yeah, I think that the, the, the study we did was a nice thing also when you, when you bring two companies together, we did quite some work on understanding the culture values of both companies better. Um, it's quite some good research what external parties do for you. And they interviewed thousands of our people. And the nice thing is it was more overlap in culture values than we thought when you looked at the, at the words. Because everybody has their values and their words on it. But if you look at how people were perceiving the values, they became much closer to each other. And then bringing two companies together is much easier when you feel that the values are mattering both, but also close to each other. Who was being interviewed in this uh, uh, investigation? We, we did thousands of people, from our store employees to our leadership. So it was really, I, I think we had 10,000 people filling in there via research, via uh, all kind of means. We did really a big chunk of people to talk about their values, what they see in the company, and that brought together. That helps us on the day still, because sometimes, of course, you see quite some diff sometimes a difference, and then you can go back and say, look why, why it matters. So I think it's also good to understand that. So you would say from this investigation, it was clear that all the way from the managers to the employees at the stores, they all shared the similar values? They, they all yeah. had... Yeah, there were some differences. Um, but like which one? Uh, no, well, one of the areas where we felt there was uh, the, the, the Ahold organization was, let's say, more what we call process structured, mm -hmm. where the Deleuze the organization was a bit more entrepreneurial, so a bit more free. And that's, of course, there you see that there is a feeling of more uh, structure approach in one of the companies and the others. Now, it's not really a value, but it could perceive as people, I have more freedom, 
or less freedom. Yeah. And that's the thing I think what you saw a bit back out of the culture of values we also saw. And then why concretely did you merge? Was it competition or lowering costs? Well, the merger has a couple of very important reasons. First of all, we all know that scale matters in our industry. So, uh, and that's about your buying prices, your consolidation in the market where we are in. So that, how, that is a, one of the reasons. Second, um, you need to invest in innovation and in technology. If you have more mass as a retailer, you can invest more. So you have more, more funds to, to use. So that's the second one. The third one, if you're a larger retailer, you can attract easier talent. So it's another one which just matters. Um, and the fourth one, certainly on the world we are in, we need not only to invest in current food retail stores, but also in the whole online world. Um, and we need to invest in the e-commerce world. So that's also important. So all these things came together. And, and this is, uh, as I will say, look, this, this was almost a logical merger because the two companies went the same trajectory of the past in the history. They were uh, going as uh, both as the first one in the US. And so there was a lot of things which could help to make it one company. So you would say that they were bound to merge together then? It Sorry? Was, it, was, it was so logical. Were they then bound to merge together? Yeah, it was very logical. It was, uh, but you know, they tried it three or four times. But you need to have the right mindset and the right um, yeah, humbleness also as companies, as leaders, to make this merger work. When, when, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of these things is not about the financials or about the economic value. It's also about the people. When did they try to merge before? Again? We this had year? talks in 2006 and the end of the 90s, the first approach were there. So they were always talking to each other in a way that it would be a nice fit. But then it was like a very long process, the merger. No, because that stopped and all. Stopped and then all. It, then there it was no build-up. No, there was no build-up at all. Then everybody started walking away and you don't like it. But at a certain moment, you need to have the right the right magnitude of, of all things coming together. Then why was it 2015? I think a couple of reasons. First of all, we both, agree, we both were even more of the opinion that scale matters, that scale was necessary for our companies to bring together. The second thing uh, was that uh, both leaders um, were, uh, and certainly for uh, Deleuze was the first time it was a non-family member anymore as leading the company. So that also helps because then you have much more a neutral view on the business. Um, and the third one, I think we, we had a good discussion together about the logic of this merger and we felt this is we need to make it work. And What was your role throughout the merger? Well, what is your role? You have, uh, you have the two CEOs coming together, you have two chairmen to coming together in a way it started always with these four people. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and I think the most important element of a, of a merger like this is you have mutual respect to each other. Um, you, uh, you trust each other. And if you see there is one blink in between that you open up again and say, look, why we have an issue here? What is the real the matter? And don't let it go. And I think that was important. Second, from a governance perspective, it's not the CEOs who are doing that, that's the board. And you have also your roles to play. And the financial side is the third element of the whole deal. How are you able to then sit down with, a, was it Franz Müller? The, with Franz Müller, because before the merger, you guys were competitors. How do you gain that mutual respect to sit down and to talk in, in such an open way, as you say? Well, I think because your mutual respect is there, because you, you're not, we, we are not competing head on head. Uh, ourselves. It's our business who's doing that. So we can also stand a bit away from that. Uh, of course, as you know, we are competing in the US together in some of the markets. We do that in Belgium. So we have some places where we compete. But you have to put yourself outside of that discussion. So look, we now are talking about what matters for the company. What is, what can we, how can we protect the heritage of this company going forward that also in 20 years from now, Ahel de Lairs is still there. And that's my obligation as a leader. Uh, my obligation as a leader is not only to be there as a CEO for a while, it's also to bring the company forward and to keep the company going forward. That's, I think, the biggest thing you can do for a CEO. You need to have strategies, you need to have a, a, a clear view of where you want to go, and you need to bring that company forward and leave that heritage forward to manage again to the next generation. We are caring for 
I said 370,000 people around the globe. You need to have that responsibility too. People are making their living out of us. So what can you do to give them at least a living? I think now is a really good time to move to the audience and see if there's any questions regarding uh, the merger, the values of Ahold, the Hoes. Uh, anyone would like to ask a question? I think there's a yes, question there's over there. The man on the blue shirt, with the blue shirt. One of the values is uh, probably verantwoord uh, maatschappelijk ondernemer. Uh, you probably would agree to uh, respect the Geneva Conventions. But your company do sell uh, small tomatoes from an occupied territory by Morocco while it's being produced in Western Sahara. And you sell products from the West Bank. And those are both violations. And it's selling stolen products. What are you going to do about it? Well, of course, we, we always take care what is where the products are coming from. Um, this specific issue, I don't know exactly what the status is of today. Um, and we, of course, buy the products and taking care for the people where we buy them from and source them from. Don't forget these people have their living out of it. So we also need to respect the fact that people grow the products and they can sell them. So that's also where we have our responsibilities. Um, and, of course, when there are territorial constraints, like you mentioned, um, uh, that might be something we, we need to consider, but we clearly are also putting first and foremost that we want to give people the living out of their, uh, their farms. And I think that's also a responsibility we have. We're, we're going we're gonna to continue, and then we're going to have other peri uh, another part of the interview where uh, the audience can yeah. ask more questions. Okay. Um. Let's continue the interview. Uh, no, there was a lady on the back there. You missed her? Oh, we're yeah. No, but we're going to have another uh, time. Oh. Yeah. Uh, don't worry, you guys will have time for more questions. Uh, so now let's move on to uh, discussing your competition. Uh, in the Netherlands, of course, as uh, Sarah said, we all know the main brands of Ajo del Hayes. We know Bold.com, we know Albert Hein, we know Holland Hall. But as you mentioned, actually, two thirds of your revenue comes from America. Which brands would you highlight as the most valuable? And which ones would you say every Dutch person or everyone here in the audience should know about? Well, I would say all, all brands are as important for me, <laughs> so I cannot select any, any of them personally. I think what is, uh, what is important for you to know, we have great heritage brands there, Stop a Shop, Hannaford, Giant, um, almost all stores between 80 and 100 years old. Uh, there is one brand maybe which is unique there, it's Peapot. It is in a, a, a startup 25 years ago, two guys, two brothers started an online business. At that moment, it was a fax machine delivering products at home. And I think it's an important asset we have because that's 2% two, two of our total sales in, in the U.S. is already purely online home delivery. So people, it's a unique business model. It's, uh, it's the one what we do here with Ahado to now. Um, and it's great to see how these two brothers brought this company where it is today. Yeah, I mean, so then let's talk about Peapot. Peapot's main competitor is Amazon, a very large and specialized company. So how do you make sure that Peapot remains competitive? Yeah, first of all, um, of course, uh, Amazon is a formidable competitor for everyone in the world nowadays, not only for... for formidable in what sense? It because pushes it's you to innovate. Uh, it's, it's big, it has, mass, uh, it has a massive presence. Um, it has a business model which is uh, purely online. So it, it, it avoids the, the store base in a way. We, though, believe strongly that our food business has something extra, extra to offer. The store relationship between Peapot, Peapot by Stop a Shop, Stop a Shop by Peapot, all these relationships we build is that we know, and that's where what matters, that food has a relationship with the, with the, with the store it comes from and how it's delivered, how it's treated. We don't talk about a book or toys. We talk about product you eat and consume. And that's why we have a big advantage as a retailer to have our own online home delivery. And it's just exactly, I think, where we can create a connection with our customers, the store and online. And it's all about food. It's about your healthy living. It's about your consumption. And you've seen Amazon also in a way searching for how they could do that well because they, they couldn't crack the nut really on home delivery with no help. And as you see, 
last year they acquired Whole Foods. So it is a different ball game, home, uh, home delivery and food online. And now that they have actually rec acquired Whole Foods, do you think that they are more competitive? Does, it, does this worry you? Well, of course. Uh, every competition in the world is, is, is giving us challenges. Um, and every competitor in the world, we need to, to be taking very serious. If it is a discounter, if it's an online retailer like, uh, like Amazon, if it is the other big guys, uh, everyone is there. So we are used to that, by the way. Don't think that 50 years ago our uh, uh, family Hein was not competing to other retailers. Yeah, it's but happening every year. Amazon is a very different retailer from, you would admit, I mean, Amazon started being only about selling books and now it sells everything. It's yeah, it's a different type of retailer, but don't forget 30 years ago, Walmart came in yeah, exactly. and started selling food. So we, we know that we have to compete with the different worlds. And that's why technology is important, artificial intelligence is important. So all these things are important for us. Yeah, we'll discuss specifically those technologies and their impact on food retail in the later part of the interview. But going back to Amazon specifically, well, not really Amazon, but American retailers. And I think you mentioned one of the biggest reasons for uh, the merger was uh, bringing in talent. Talent is, is uh, you can approach talent better by being a larger company. It, it, don't you feel sometimes that you're sometimes competing against Amazon uh, and well, other Silicon Valley companies that are able to pull talent from often the best universities in the world? Like, how yeah, do you no, keep uh, up with that? Uh, for sure, it's a fight and a battle for talent. We, we know that. And that's also for us important. So we, we, we fight for talent. We, 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 the difference, I think, is we also need talent who understand our physical world well. So we also need different talent sometimes uh, than the artificial world, artificial intelligence view what, uh, what, what, what Amazon needs. So we need also artificial intelligence, but we need also people who understand how you create hospitality in a store. So we also need people who understand the category and the products. So we need buyers who understand where you get the fruits from and the meat from. But this is the whole experience model, right? Like to focus retailing on the experience of the consumer. I think if you look at food, it is very important to make the balance between efficiency and experience. And I think for us in retail, and certainly for supermarket retailers, that is that third element, convenience. So you bring these th three elements together, experience, convenience, and uh, uh, the one which is so important that you sell the products where you know where they come from. So you have the expertise. Uh, and I think these things you can capture together. And I think that's still where where we believe that the store matters to us and to you, even in the long run. It's a daily routine, a weekly routine. So you could say, look, everything could be online. But you also want to have experience. You want to have inspiration when you think about your dinner for the evening. So we need to help you also with that. Related to that, uh, you mentioned, I think, in an interview with Bloomberg that in order to compete against Amazon and this uh, online-focused retailers, you want to make supermarkets uh, more attractive, sexier, I think that's the term you use. How can you actually do that? How, how do you go forward? What concrete plans? Uh, no, I think what you need you to do is to make, on one hand, the efficiency of the store. So uh, your whole checkout process to pay and to come in. I think that could be very easy. Your center store could be easier where you buy the staples, so the, 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 the prepacked product. But what you need to do is to work on the fresh side, cooking in the stores creating health centers, what we do in the U.S. now, with nutritionists, with helping you on a healthier in balance the of your life. Themselves. In the supermarkets itself. We have nutritionists in our stores, more and more stores in the United States, where we help our customers to discover back what healthy food means. We can do that online. You can do all these on, um, online. We, we, uh, we will start this week, but I think, with Albert Heijn, um, your own health um, dashboard, in, uh, in, in so which you can use with your products you buy, so when you have your bonus card, you register products, you can use your bonus card, you see what you buy. And if you then buy chocolate, you can also see which kind of chocolate has less sugar than, 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 than the one you buy. So you're going to help people. I think on the sustainability side, on where we get the products from, is, is an enormous opportunity still to show our role, which we play with our farmers, with our uh, growers. So uh, but a lot how we can do. How would that not work online? I think everything can work online, but the social interaction is difficult online. You can yeah. sit behind your screen for the whole evening, 
um, you don't meet anyone else than maybe uh, a customer help desk. I think there's also a social place of a store. So what you see in a lot of our stores, you see tables in the stores, you see coffee machines where you drink your coffee. So there is also social interaction. And food is something which you want to be discovering. And there is a lot of to discover in food every day. But do you think then consumers want uh, to stay in the supermarket or is the uh, Ajo del Hayes that wants consumers in the supermarket? We want the omnichannel world for our customers. So we want to touch them every time, every day, every hour, every minute in a way. And it can be in the store, it can be online, it can be on your, on your web. Uh, we can help you with your dinner this evening. Uh, we can do that online, we can pick it up in the store, you can do everything. That's what we want to capture. But it's all about the food equation. How can we help you healthier choices? How can, can we guide you through that awful, uh, let's say, situation that we see today, that people are more and more imposed to health issues which are around obesitas, diabetes. And it's amazing for me in the world today, and it's one of the things I did in Davos the last couple of years, that we spend awful lot of money in cure and in, let's say, uh, the whole thing after you have a problem with your disease and your health. Why are we not spending more money in the prevention? Because if we prevent our, our society much better, we can save a lot of money in healthcare. Healthcare is number one or two in every income budget of a state or cost budget of a state mm -hmm. today. So how can we help them to reduce these costs? And, you and that's where we can we can responsibility. we can uh, we can play a role in that. We need to work on prevention. <coughs> How do you, for example, for the health related or for any really strategy that Ajo del Hayes has? How do you coordinate with the different brands? For example, uh, people, of course, it's only online grocery stores, but then you have Food Lion. Do they communicate with each other? How yeah. exactly do you uh, enroll those uh, market-wide uh, plans? Yeah, we have a clear let's say, simple A4 as a strategy. And a strategy has a couple of very important elements in it. For instance, health or fresh is an important driver. The promises we make, the business wheel we use, the, the promise and the purpose we have, uh, being better together, fresh inspiration every day. Set something about what we want to be, fresh inspiration every day. We want to inspire you mm -hmm. as a customer. That is the guideline for every brand. They start working from there then I like them just also to make them more specific. So I don't want them to be all the same in the world. We are not one brand fit everywhere in the same. We want to make them also their own glue. So that's the way we have outlined our strategy. They have the freedom to implement. But of course, they report back on the important levers. One of our important levers is the promises we have to our customers. A better place to shop, a better place to work, and a better neighbor. And what can we do to help in the society? How do we create a good relationship with our associates? So these promises are important for us as a driver. So to quickly bring it back to the US, you have 2,258 stores. And all of them are located on the East Coast. Is this a strategic, strategic decision or are there plans to move to the West as well? No, the strategic decision was for a lot of our, uh, let's say for the history of the company, I think, when you fly out or you take a boat, the first thing you end in the US <laughs> is the East Coast. I think it's simple as it was. Secondly, there is most of the population on that side. So there's a lot of population on the East Coast. You know, all the big cities are there. So that's another reason I think they started there. Um, and the US is a huge, huge continent. We always think about one, one, one country, but it's not one country. It's a huge yeah. continent. Mm -hmm. So I never see the US also as one country. It's by east states. Line. Yeah, state by state, or it's east, it's south, it's north, it's midwest, and west. So even for a retailer, you have not to look at the US as one whole. But are there plans to expand throughout the US or none? We always uh, uh, continue, of course, are on the watch. We just merged uh, two companies together. So we continue, we'll look at opportunities uh, to dance or to strengthen our market position on the US side. I think to summarize uh, the competition in America, uh, in an interview with the Financial Times or in a profile more, you said that you did not want to move to America, despite of course being your greatest source of revenue. However, do you think that in the future, seeing that you're doing so well in America, uh, Franz Mueller, your uh, 
the next CEO. Will he have to move? Will he move to America? Is it out of out of necessity? Well, at least today's company is based in the Netherlands, with a headquarters in the Netherlands, and we're very happy with that. <laughs> I'm not going to stand in the feet of Mr. Mueller. Um, so this company is a Dutch-based company. It has the uh, uh, the origin here, uh, together now with Belgium, and I think it's a good place to be. Well, then let's uh, move to this place and uh, let's talk about grocery markets in the EU. Who would you say are your top three competitors in the European market? Well, I would say they are very local nowadays in the European market. Uh, if you would ask me that question 10 years ago, it was Carrefour, Tesco. Uh, today, it's Lidl, it's Aldi, which are prominent, very strong competitors in the world we are in in Europe. And for the rest, you have a lot of strong local country-based retailers. So and they th are this is a trend, right? Uh, the trend from hypermarkets such as uh, Tesco and uh, Carrefour in a way. You think now the success is more the local brands. They are the ones that consumers want. I think what you see in the world is that uh, uh, retailing is, has always been very local, supermarket retailing. It has long history often with the retail businesses. Um, and the scale matters, but it is not a global scale. Quite often it's a regional scale, what you need to have. So our current retailers are quite often strong local competitors here. So Torim, bring it back to uh, Little and Aldi. Uh, they've increased, I think, last year 18% in their value, according to the FDA. And they seem to really contradict your own vision of making supermarkets prettier. Because if you actually go to the supermarkets, they're not the most attractive ones. H how do you explain this phenomenon? Why are consumers going towards supermarkets that are not necessarily enjoyable to stay? Yeah, no, uh, you, you see, by the way, the two different things. You see the origin of the business is clearly uh, a, a very, let's say, uh, simple store. If I see some of the new inventions they do, they also make the store nice. So I was yesterday in Belgium, I saw a couple of their stores, and uh, they start to be closer to supermarkets and hard discounters. So you see also they evolving and evolving their business model. I think what, what matters for customers quite often is uh, the lowest price. And I think what we need to do as retailers to offer more than the lowest price. So we need to have a selection, and we need to work on how we can differentiate ourselves from only low price operators. And we know that customers love low prices, uh, but we also should enthuse them and uh, make them enthusiastic about other things. But would you then say that the sudden growth of Aldi and Lidl is due to them changing and kind of innovating their supermarkets no, they're, rather they're, than low they're prices? Most, uh, they're mostly growing because of fast expansion in all the markets they are. So they continue to expand the new markets. There are not that many models in food retailing who are easily to copy in other markets, but the hard discount model is easy to, mo mo to model. It's not very complicated, so you can do that in every market where you operate. Where a traditional supermarket is more difficult to do that. So that's why you see them growing fast in expansion of new stores. Mm. And what about Amazon? I mean, it doesn't seem like Amazon is a huge competition in the European market right now, but do you worry that they're planning on bringing their Whole Foods formula also to the Europe? Well, I think they will uh, they will continue to fine tune their model for food. I think that the journey they are in. Um, th they have been doing different things already. They just made an, uh, a new arrangement, I think, in France with a food retailer. So you can do it a multiple way. You can buy business or you can make arrangement. That's why for us it's so important here in the Netherlands and Belgium to work with Bol.com because the connection between Bol, Albert Heijn and Deleuze is as, as strong should it be as Amazon is doing that themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, I said be beginning already, Amazon is a formidable competitor. Let's not underestimate their strength. There's a very, very strong competitor for us in the world and a new competitor coming from the different angles. So we need to understand better what they do and how we can react. And the only thing I said before, we have been proven over the last 130 years that new entrants of competition, we also can offset with our own views. So we need to rethink our model sometimes to address it again and then be strong again. So. Do you think you have more experience than Amazon? I mean, it's a we clearly have much more experience in food. Yeah, in food. Uh, I think it is an uh, an under maybe underestimated, <coughs> and that that experience is necessary. You need to understand the supply chain. Um, you buy your tomatoes here on the corner of the street. Do you think what has to be happening sometimes before that? 
uh, how we need to manage that and how the cold chain is important and how you find these 15 types of tomatoes on the shelf. That's a lot of work. That's intelligence, that's understanding your whole supply chain. You can make a, a lot of mistakes in that. So it seems to be a simple job. I can tell you it's more complicated. I would like to challenge you a bit on that. <laughs> So we talked uh, a bit about your competition, Amazon, Little Aldi here, uh, and it seems from the competition that at the same time, Ajo de Hayes has needs different models, business models, or different strategies for each continent. Would you say these are explicit in, in the business, or would you say, generally speaking, they are the same strategy? Or No, I would say that all our businesses around the globe have a similar strategy. We want to be number one and two in the market. We want to play ourselves in the added value of supermarkets. So we want to do more than only low prices. We want to bring a variety. We want to play a social role. So there's a lot of common themes in, but it is differently executed in Greece than in Romania, as simple like that. And would you also say that, I mean, you mentioned health already, you're a health fanatic yourself. Would you say that there are certain consumer differences between the US and the EU market in terms oh yeah. of health? Yeah, for sure. First of all, People are different. And, uh, uh, health is, seems to be an easy thing, but it's also very complicated. Um, we, for instance, in the Netherlands, um, by eating more, a lot of bread, we get more salt in than you think. Where people who are less bread eater get maybe more sugar in. Even if you go, so there is, a, there is a different way of how people have been eating and the habits they have and how that impacts your health. So we, we need to do more work in every market, and sometimes markets have more similarities, than only say, look, we... Uh, and of course, our main effort here, for instance, in the Netherlands and everywhere, is reducing sugar. Start with that. Sugar is everywhere. Um, take tomato ketchup, it's half of sugar, and the rest is a bit whatever, sometimes. And there are good <laughs> tomato ketchups, which are much more tomatoes, I can tell you, you can find it on the shelf of Albert Heim, and even without sugar today. Um, but there are, it's, it, we, we need to get better understanding what is necessary in the health, from a health point of view, in the different markets. But it's all about the three elements, reducing fat, reducing sugar, reducing salt. But it's not per se said that every country has the same, uh, let's say, uh, health Efficiencies. issues or health causes. Uh, the US clearly is much more sugar driven there's a history behind that. Sugar was much easier to get in the US than anywhere else. So. And another pressing issue, I think, for many young people, and this also for me personally, is climate change. And we see a lot of petitions actually um, trying to get supermarkets to introduce plastic-free aisles or less plastic-free products. Um, what is Ahold has actually doing to address these consumer concerns? Well, we do immense things, I would say, in the world. We want to go to... Uh, no landfill in the world. We haven't put that hard on the table, but that's where we're aiming for. No landfill? No landfill of waste. Okay. So we want to re recycle all the waste we get from our stores. Uh, Albert Heijn is 100% already recyclable. So we recycle all the waste. Now you can have a debate on plastics. Yeah. You can recycle it, but is it still, it's it still an, an, an impact on, on, on environment. So I agree with that. We're working with all our trucks here in the Netherlands to get them let's say, emission-free or uh, low-emission uh, cars, uh, gas, natural gas, or whatever. Um, our stores are 100%, so we opened a store in a couple of years ago, two years ago, which is completely uh, sustainable. So we even give the energy back. Imagine that you cool your products and you still can give an energy back to somebody else, the neighbors in this case, in the, in the, in the shopping center. So we work a Where lot on this. Where was this shop again? Where was this shop? It was in Permanent, a big Excel. We completely made it uh, neutral, climate neutral in a way. But even that, that they had more energy so they could give back energy to the other stores. So that's the work we do. There is a lot still to aim for. I uh, understand the demand for plastics, which is important. And there is a balancing act, because you can have the food waste on one hand if you don't use the plastic, or you use the plastic and you recycle the plastic. So that's all kind of questions we have to answer. If I would go back to the store of my father 40 years ago, we wouldn't have plastic because everything was, 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 but then was weighted by him, more or less. So <coughs> but then what's your answer? Working hard of alternatives. We have to work with the industry on alternatives. Alternative packaging, 
alternative way of, uh, of producing. So we have to work hard on that. That's our vertical integration. We work with our farmers, with our growers, with our factories, how we can reduce the, uh, the, the, the climate emissions. So we need to work on all these things. And I think we are one of the, the leading retailers in the world on this, but you know it's never enough. It's with all these cases, never enough. We opened together with uh, a young team, management trainees who came in. Uh, they opened one, one restaurant here in Amsterdam, Instock. Maybe you know it. Instock is driving now. That's, you should know it. You should visit it today and have a dinner there. Instock is a restaurant, and we now have three of them, where we recycle the remainings of the store. Because you can, of course, reuse it for energy. But what they do is they go back, they have electrical cars, they go to the stores, they see what is left over, and they make a meal of that. So that's also part of, of, of recyclable. But do you know that the big part of our waste comes from the customer? You're wasting most. We as customers waste most of the food. And the primary production. Because the primary production there... Uh, the processes are less developed to have the demand, so they overproduce at the wrong moments, and then you have a lot of waste too. So we need to have the whole chain much better in control and understand better what we need from the farmers and what we need and what you need to do at home, how you might use maybe differently also the final expiry date, that even if the expiry date is on and over, that the food might still eatable. Um, but then we throw it all away. <coughs> so would you then say, as you said, we create a lot of waste ourselves, would you then say that the responsibility of climate change and even health falls on the consumer, you as a company, or the government? Uh, I would say it's always public-private, but to my opinion, it's a role of the society to take, and we need to educate our customers. Yeah, but the society is exactly those three different groups. I, I know, who but who I should I take the leading would, role. I wouldn't... I, I don't think it's a government who should take that role. I think it is public partnership what we need to do. Um, I'm chairing the Consumer Goods Forum. Manufacturers and retailers are there together. together. Next week in, in Singapore, I'm there again. And we have four big themes. Sustainability, so where to source, what do we do with plastics, what do we do with palm oil, etc. Second, health. The third one is how do you use technology better to predict better, the, uh, the, and the fourth one is data. So what we do is set ambitions for ourselves, how we can reduce that. And the second role we need to play as retailers is educate. We need to educate our customers. That's what we can do. So guide customers in the store when it's about health. Give them what we call guiding stars. We're rolling that out now in the U.S. We introduce here in the Netherlands at Groene Vinkje, the healthy label, the healthy logo, to help our customers. So we have a role to play, and I think governments can, can of course, support that, but I think we as a public companies should take uh, leading roles in that. But wouldn't you then say that that creates, or that creates an atmosphere for different markets to actually abuse the fact that the government is not intervening? Sorry, I... I would, would it as in how other supermarkets can then be unsustainable and... Yeah, but you know, I had a discussion uh, always. I think you need to set the, the line in the sand and then you start working on it. I think what we do in Consumer Goods Forum is make commitments, public commitments, and then I hope that the public commitments are strong enough for all retailers and all manufacturers to start moving to that direction. And sometimes you need a government to set clear rules. So I'm not saying that, uh, that, that the government can't play a role. I think the government can play a role. I, I do believe that it's our own responsibility to make the moves and not waiting for governmental laws or rules and regulation. I think we need to start ourselves to do this. That's my personal ambition, and, and that's why we do it with sustainability. That's why we do it with health. We need to take our own responsibilities. You mentioned in an interview with the Financial Times that, in general, the food retail industry is a consumer-driven industry. Then, talking about your businesses and how you approach consumers in both America and in Europe, what would you highlight as the key differences between these two groups? Or is that impossible? Between the two groups? Of between the groups of uh, European consumers and American consumers. Well, I think um, there are some differences, I must say. Of course, everybody's eating, uh, everybody's consuming. <laughs> um, I think the 
European consumers um, have been more aware, to my opinion, on sustainability than the American consumers. I think for the American consumers, it's still something which is far away. It's not, and it starts now. If you look at the Wh West why Coast, why do you think that's it? Th because that's the case. Uh, if if you, I think it has to do with density of population. Uh, I think we have much more people in Europe. We have 500 million people in Europe on the on on not not even two thirds of the size of the U.S. Mm -hmm. so 300 million in the U.S. living in two two times the European size, so two and a, one and a half times. So we have much more density, so less space. We're much more confronted with emission issues. We're much more confronted with all the issues of society. I think we have a history on that. Where the Americans have that more freedom, like what? it's all okay, everybody's going, you're responsible for yourself. And I think that's different. I see on the West and the East Coast now, a lot of attention now on sustainability coming in, also on the US side. And I think it's necessary that consumers are recognizing that. We but are not the only one who could do consumers. it. Hmm? Uh, you have programs about teaching and education. Yeah, but also we need the consumers to start demanding it from us. It's, yeah. a, it's a side effect. It's a, it's a combination of both. We cannot... So listening to your consumers is the most important thing you can do. And when society start talking about these things, uh, like sustainability, we need to be in front of that. We need to be ahead of it in a way. We need to to find already before that happens our that these societal ele elements will come up. So we need to think about it. I think now is a good time to go to the audience and ask uh, and see if there's any questions uh, related to the topics discussed. Uh, yes, over there, the sir here. Yeah. Uh, regarding the reduction of healthcare and um, educating your customers, would you consider banning cigarettes from your stores? Uh, that's a, a, a good question, and um, it's a difficult question also. We have always had the principle, we need to educate and we need to give customers choice. Unless it's forbidden by a government, we should not sell it. So we, But we need to educate, we need to help customers. And the whole cigarette discussion is the one which is just flipping the corner, maybe. Um, so you, you need to... You need to educate what, well, what, what is happening with cigarettes already over the last decades is information, negative information, behind screens now. But you should stop something which is not, let's say, prohibited by the government that you can sell it. Um, that's, I think, the, 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 the one which is the most difficult one to decide as a retailer. Um, because at the same time, you eliminate a big customer group to say, look, I'm not selling your products anymore. Although, we might understand it's quite an unhealthy product. We have time for another question. Uh, the girl over there, because she wanted to ask a question before. Hi. Okay. Um, what is currently the greatest challenge in managing the supply chain for you? Sorry? The greatest challenge in managing supply. Yeah. Well, the, the greatest challenge in managing supply is... Um, there is more and more demand in the world. So how do we uh, have the, the, the demand fulfilled? Because customers expect anytime, every moment, all the products they can find in the world. So we need to have strawberries the whole year round. Where 10, 30 years ago, they were only in summer there. So how can we get that supply chain organized? Um, that's one. Uh, secondly, of course, we need to be much more aware of um, the, the situation where people in the supply chain, um, say, are trading. So what we need to do, and our responsibility is, how are uh, people paid in, in, in markets? So uh, the things we do with our Albert Heijn uh, Africa Foundation, a foundation is to build relationships with our farmers in Africa and to be sure that there is a reasonable, uh, uh, a reasonable social cohesion around it. And we fund 2% of our uh, sourcing back again into their farms in education and medical support and social impact. So these kind of things we try to do also to be the responsible retailer, not only that we buy the products, but also know where they come from. Thank you very much for those questions. Uh, 
So l looking ahead in the next 50 years, it looks very difficult, I think, for root, uh, food retailing. On one hand, there is the need to feed potentially 9 billion people, and on the other is addressing the concerns with regards to climate change or health concerns of consumers, especially in the already wealthy world, uh, high-income world of Europe and America. H and you, say, you said in an interview with Mackenzie that there needs to be a balance between these two. Uh, how exactly are you going to balance this? I must say, I give you a compliment on the study and the research you did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I've, I've, you read all my interviews almost now. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, now, you, 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 you took me off my your real question, so sorry about it. So, uh, in McKinsey's study, what did I say there? You said that there... <laughs> <laughs> You, you say that there needs to be a balance between feeding consumers or, and also uh, taking cons into consideration the uh, climate change concerns of people. Yeah. So no. how would you balance this out? Some would say that it's, a, it's really a trade-off. No, I think what you need to do as a retailer, uh, if, uh, if as a retailer we need to find more sources for food. So there's a lot of discussion and with our... Uh, so how much plant-based food you can create and how do you make plant-based food uh, tasteful, uh, vegetarian? Because let's put uh, it, uh, the fact on 9 billion people also have, of course, that the people who are getting now, let's say, wealthy, start eating differently than they did in the past. So we need to understand that there is more demand in the world and we need to reduce maybe some of our demands to make it more available. And that's why I think... Who's we? I think we as retailers could help our customers to understand and to give better offers. So we, we all learned when that you eat meat, you eat meat every day. Why do you eat meat every day? You can also eat meat fish, you can meat vegetarian, you can eat other, mm -hmm. other, other alternatives which are less harmful for the planet. So I think that's what we need to, to educate customers with and to understand better that that's helpful and helping our, our, our world. So that's where we can play a role. So which technology of the ones that we often hear about in the media, such as machine learning, artificial intelligence, voice intelligence, and automation, which one do you think is going to be the most useful at addressing, at exactly rolling out your strategy? Uh, well, I think for us, is artificial intelligence is an important one, including machine learning, because they going to help us to in what area? Is it in the, in the, in the supply it's, or it's is a it lot more in the, the supply chain? experience? It's a lot in the supply chain where we can use that much better in predicting and, uh, and making our stores more, uh, more personal for our customers, so the right product at the right place. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's what we learned from Ball.com also. How do you make your, your store your store because your shop here on the corner and, and how is that much more connected to the environment we are in, so there and, and the whole prediction of our supply chain, the category management we do. So there's a lot of work we can do. If I look at voice, voice is going to help us a lot in uh, the interaction with our customers. Uh, so you can use voice between uh, the online demand of the customer, where we can get, instead of that you make the list, you speak the list. So. Mm -hmm. That's going to help us. Um, technology in the store will help us to make your shopping experience easier. So you come into the with your phone in the store, you scan your product, and you leave. What we do currently with to go with Armour Hand to go, where you use your phone, you scan, and you pay. You have paid already. So there are a lot of things we can do. I see. Uh, related to artificial intelligence and, of course, machine learning in that regards, it seems that a lot of startups in the Netherlands, in Europe as a whole, and even in America, a lot of startups, startups are starting to use the, in their descriptions that they use uh, artificial intelligence and all this sort of uh, uh, buzzwords. And oftentimes, if you look at them a closer examination, they're uh, not really that. Uh, don't you feel that this development or this hype will potentially not match the expectations of consumers and therefore like truly breaking a trust between the consumer and of course the retailer. H yeah. How do you see that? Is that a yeah, problem? Yeah, I, I think if you currently look at what technology can, there could be still a mismatch between your, at the end of the day, you can predict a lot what you did before. Mm -hmm. So that's learning. But predict the future is much more difficult, even for artificial intelligence. You can, so that's what 
what, let's say, the debate will be. Can we help you finally in the right selection when you are in the store? And can we do that in the same way? While trying to be personal as yeah. well. Yeah, and trying to be personal as well. So I think that's a big uh, debate and, and dilemma that is. On the other hand, I think technology will help you and me to make my shopping easier um, and to spend more or l different time in the store where you are encouraged uh, using your phone with all the information which you get in front of uh, the fresh uh, uh, products or the products you want to buy is much easier instead of reading. Um, so there's a lot you can do with technology which is going to help us. But it will be some, and I'm, I'm personally, I don't think so much that the technology of today will evolve too. So if we start thinking what is today, is that the only solution? I think there will be new evolutions coming in. So this fourth industrial revolution will bring new tools which we don't know. Of course, yeah. uh, the, the famous you cannot predict the future anymore. You have to learn the future by doing. And you actually mentioned voice intelligence, and we see a lot of consumer positive responses towards these voice machines, such as Alexa from Amazon. But even the Albert Hein had one, Hiku. How it was dropped, and um, because due to a lack of demand from the market. No, we're going to reintroduce later this year together with Google quite some new things around it. So uh, we're working on it to get it a better the connection with our business, so we, 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 we will have a nice relaunch at the, lot of the la second part of this year. So you that. think consumers will be responsive this time? I think it is. I think it start, will start. It will also have a negative thing, so people, uh, you, you always, the first innovation is always nice, but it will be a moment that you rethink if this is the right thing to do, because at the end of the day, voice hear you the whole day. So what is the interaction at a certain moment from people about personal, uh, your, 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 your how do you do that? So I think that's also a world we're in. By the way, maybe nice to mention, of course, artificial intelligence is important. We just signed with you uh, the UVA, the UVA, and the, the, UVA uh, the Air Lab. So we're also working closely with your university on that because we want to attract students from these universities start working for us and not only for Google. Good. It's not so <laughs> difficult to get them in ball, but we want to have <laughs> them also at Albert Heijn. So um, if I can make one play here, then I would like to do it. Well, in terms of working at the Albert Heijn, I think, um, as I mentioned in my introduction speech, you are now able to check out your groceries without actually um, having to go to a cashier, which reduces the need for cashiers. And in the 11 years that you have been uh, the president of the Albert Heijn, do you feel responsible for the, um, for the livelihood of these cashiers? Yeah, I think you feel always responsible for everyone who works for us. On the other hand, we cannot stop technology and we need to embrace technology. And jobs will change. I think the biggest evolution we're going to get in the next decades is that jobs will change continuously. Um, and that's what we we and you have to learn because that's the world you're in. Your study doesn't stop after your major here or your master here. Uh, there will be new moments that you need to learn yourself new skills. And I think that's what in retail and what we need to do also. We need to continue to evolve ourselves. And by the way, I, I, I would say also from the checkout perspective, we would like to replace some people more as, as hostess as people in the stores to guide you through the store so that you get a different experience again. So how can we simplify the way of shopping, make it easier, and at the same time have a better experience? And I think that, uh, let's be honest, the, the cashier, although they are lovely people in our business and we like them a lot, it is for you as a customer quite the last moment is now, there's a queue and here's a queue, how can I get out quickly? So it's not the most favorable moment. For some people it is, by the way. Yeah. If you look at some older people, they like to go in a queue because they know this cashier is a very nice person. So a lot of our stores you see a mix of self-scan and, and, and checkout. Before we end this interview, because we're running out of time, uh, we mentioned, and you mentioned actually, uh, at the beginning of the interview that you're retiring. And indeed, uh, I think it seems, it's very obvious that you're quite passionate about this business and, well, your own company. Uh, in fact, the former chairman of Ahold uh, said about you, and I quote, he is emotionally invested in the business, the customers, that is his world. Considering this, why do you think it's time, time to retire now? Well, you know, I think a CEO um, is guiding a company, and that is 
maybe not everyone agrees with that, but I think <laughs> there is a period that you have to have succession in place to get over it. And I think personally seven, eight years is a good period. Two times, two periods of four years. That's one. So I think because you, as a CEO, you need to steer the company continuously to new innovation, to new, a new way of thinking. So although you have a strategy, you need to continue to guide them to new levels of your organization. So I think there is a, a good momentum at the CEO level, uh, to my opinion, where you still have the energy and you still bring the innovation as one. So that's why I think eight years after is a good momentum. Um, secondly, um, also for myself, being in this job for 20 years at Ahold, having spent and having done a lot of very um, intense jobs with Albert Heijn, repositioning, Ahold, everything what happens there, and then finally this big merger, it also asks a lot of your energy. Um, so spending a bit a different way of using my energy and maybe spending more time on the things that do matter to society, uh, do matter to work with startups and mentor uh, entrepreneurs who are busy with their views. I think that's also a new phase of my life and spend some more time with my family. Okay. And I'm sure they're looking forward to. And after years of having, um, of, of having been in business and having um, spent time with people, having disagreements, what advice could you give these students who want to, be have, a, who want to have a successful career like yours? Well, I, will, I would say there's a couple of things which you, what I would say, but one is um, you have to have passion for whatever you do. The passion is matters, I think, most in a career. If you find something where you don't have passion, don't, don't stay there because you need to feel the passion of a business. That's nice with retail, by the way, you feel the passion because it's every day on. So that the passion you can also have in technology because you're, you're more technical savvy. So that, that's where I think it starts with passion. It starts with um, a good ambition, but not over ambitious. I think you also need to, uh, need to uh, need to make a career um, with a with a, you can have an ambition, but you also need to take the moments of your period every time with a lot of uh, fun and and creating your own expertise. Have Whereas you been doing that? Do yeah, I have been doing that. I have been doing that. I've never been in my life that I thought 40 years ago that I would be the CEO of Arnold Delers. I never thought about it, but every time I took a job uh, and I took risks, I went abroad. Uh, and and my, my friends and colleagues said, well, what are you going to do there? You never know with this business, blah, blah, blah. Worked, worked abroad with my family. Take, take these steps. But I never had that clear final ambition, I want to be the CEO of this company. I only thought this is a nice part of my journey. And I learned of every part of the journey. And, sec and lastly, maybe it's, always, it's not always up. Sometimes it's also a horizontal move. So sometimes you also need to make a horizontal move to broaden yourself, to get more experience. And I see a lot of people, I only want to go this direction. And sometimes you make the direction like this, I did the same. So I think you need to learn that also a bit. To different industries? Or sometimes different industries, I didn't do a lot of different industries, I did food service and retail, but also in, in the jobs you're in. You go from a category manager to an operational manager in Albert Heijn, and you could have a horizontal move where a lot of people think, now I need to ne make a next step in my move. Okay. So that's a bit, I think, where you can learn out of your career. Um, and last but not least, you have to run sometimes also to the wall and something goes wrong <coughs> and learn from that. It's so easy only to think everything should be successful. No. And the earlier you have that in a career that something goes completely wrong and that your boss said, Dick, we take you off this job because that was not good enough. That's a hard message. Yeah. But you learn more from that than only success, I can tell you. Well, thank you very much for all of these questions. And before we give uh, Mr. Boer a warm round of applause, I'd just like to remind you that Room for Discussion has a very busy schedule this uh, month. On Saturday, we have another interview with the rector, uh, Geert ten Dam, on uh, University Day, and you can still sign up for that. And on the 13th of June, we have the CEO of ABN AMRO coming and um, Arnold Bode, the professor in corporate finance. On, um, on the banks and 10 years after the financial crisis. But now, for now, please give our guests a warm round of applause.
Thank you very much.